Medieval Latin was the form of Latin used in Roman Catholic Western Europe during the Middle Ages. In this region it served as the primary written language, the local languages were also written to varying degrees. Latin functioned as the main medium of scholarly exchange, as the liturgical language of the Church, and as the working language of science, literature, law, and administration. Medieval Latin represented, in essence, an attempt to continue Classical Latin and Late Latin, with enhancements for new concepts as well as for the increasing integration of Christianity. Despite some meaningful differences from Classical Latin, medieval writers did not regard it as a fundamentally different language. There is no real consensus on the exact boundary where Late Latin ends and Medieval Latin begins. Some scholarly surveys begin with the rise of early ecclesiastical Latin in the middle of the 4th century, others around 500, and still others with the replacement of written Late Latin by written Romance languages starting around the year 900. The terms Medieval Latin and Ecclesiastical Latin are often used synonymously, though some scholars draw distinctions. Ecclesiastical Latin refers specifically to the form that has been used by the Roman Catholic Church, whereas Medieval Latin refers more broadly to all of the written forms of Latin used in the Middle Ages. The Romance languages spoken in the Middle Ages were often referred to as Latin, since the Romance languages were all descended from Classical, or Roman, Latin itself. <laughs> Influences Christian Latin Medieval Latin had an enlarged vocabulary, which freely borrowed from other sources. It was heavily influenced by the language of the Vulgate, which contained many peculiarities alien to Classical Latin that resulted from a more or less direct translation from Greek and Hebrew. The peculiarities mirrored the original not only in its vocabulary but also in its grammar and syntax. Greek provided much of the technical vocabulary of Christianity. The various Germanic languages spoken by the Germanic tribes, who invaded southern Europe, were also major sources of new words. Germanic leaders became the rulers of parts of the Roman Empire that they conquered, and words from their languages were freely imported into the vocabulary of law. Other more ordinary words were replaced by coinages from vulgar Latin or Germanic sources because the classical words had fallen into disuse. Latin was also spread to areas such as Ireland and Germany, where Romance languages were not spoken, and which had never known Roman rule. Works written in those lands where Latin was a learned language, having no relation to the local vernacular, also influenced the vocabulary and syntax of medieval Latin. Since subjects like science and philosophy, including argumentation theory and ethics pre-law, were communicated in Latin, the Latin vocabulary that developed for them became the source of a great many technical words in modern languages. English words like abstract, subject, communicate, matter, probable and their cognates in other European languages generally have the meanings given to them in medieval Latin. Topic. Vulgar Latin. The influence of Vulgar Latin was also apparent in the syntax of some medieval Latin writers, although Classical Latin continued to be held in high esteem and studied as models for literary compositions. The high point of the development of medieval Latin as a literary language came with the Carolingian Renaissance, a rebirth of learning kindled under the patronage of Charlemagne, King of the Franks. Alcuin was Charlemagne's Latin secretary and an important writer in his own right. His influence led to a rebirth of Latin literature and learning after the depressed period following the final disintegration of the authority of the Western Roman Empire. Although it was simultaneously developing into the Romance languages, Latin itself remained very conservative, as it was no longer a native language and there were many ancient and medieval grammar books to give one standard form. On the other hand, strictly speaking, there was no single form of Medieval Latin. Every Latin author in the medieval period spoke Latin as a second language, with varying degrees of fluency and syntax. Grammar and vocabulary, however, were often influenced by an author's native language. This was especially true beginning around the 12th century, after which the language became increasingly adulterated. Late medieval Latin documents written by French speakers tend to show similarities to medieval French grammar and vocabulary, those written by Germans tend to show similarities to German, etc. For instance, rather than following the classical Latin practice of generally placing the verb at the end, medieval writers would often follow the conventions of their own native language instead. 
Whereas Latin had no definite or indefinite articles, medieval writers sometimes used forms of unis as an indefinite article, and forms of ill reflecting usage in the Romance languages as a definite article or even quidum meaning a certain one, thing, in classical Latin as something like an article. Unlike classical Latin, where esse, to be, was the only auxiliary verb, medieval Latin writers might use haber, to have as an auxiliary, similar to constructions in Germanic and Romance languages. The accusative and infinitive construction in Classical Latin was often replaced by a subordinate clause introduced by quad or quia. This is almost identical, for example, to the use of k in similar constructions in French. In every age from the late 8th century onwards, there were learned writers especially within the church who were familiar enough with classical syntax to be aware that these forms and usages were wrong and resisted their use. Thus the Latin of a theologian like St. Thomas Aquinas or of an erudite clerical historian such as William of Tyre tends to avoid most of the characteristics described above, showing its period in vocabulary and spelling alone. The features listed are much more prominent in the language of lawyers e.g. the 11th century English Doomsday Book, physicians, technical writers and secular chroniclers. However the use of quad to introduce subordinate clauses was especially pervasive and is found at all levels. Topic. Changes in vocabulary, syntax, and grammar Medieval Latin had ceased to be a living language and was instead a scholarly language of the minority of educated men in medieval Europe used in official documents more than for everyday communication. This resulted in two major features of medieval Latin compared with classical Latin, though when it is compared to the other vernacular languages, medieval Latin developed very few changes. First, many authors attempted to show off their knowledge of classical Latin by using rare or archaic constructions, sometimes anachronistically haphazardly mixing constructions from Republican and Imperial Latin, which in reality existed centuries apart. Second, many lesser scholars had a limited grasp of proper Latin or were increasingly influenced by Vulgar Latin, which was mutating into the Romance languages. Word order usually tended towards that of the vernacular language of the author, not the artificial and polished word order of classical Latin. Conversely, an erudite scholar might attempt to show off by intentionally constructing a very complicated sentence. Because Latin is an inflected language, it is technically possible to place related words at opposite ends of a paragraph-long sentence, and owing to the complexity of doing so, it was seen by some as a sign of great skill. Typically, prepositions are used much more frequently as in modern Romance languages for greater clarity, instead of using the ablative case alone. Further, in classical Latin the subject of a verb was often left implied, unless it was being stressed. Videt Topic. He sees. For clarity, medieval Latin more frequently includes an explicit subject, is videt. He sees, without necessarily stressing the subject. Various changes occurred in vocabulary, and certain words were mixed into different declensions or conjugations. Many new compound verbs were formed. Some words retained their original structure but drastically changed in meaning. Animositas specifically means wrath in medieval Latin, while in classical Latin, it generally referred to high spirits, excited spirits of any kind. Owing to heavy use of biblical terms, there was a large influx of new words borrowed from Greek and Hebrew and even some grammatical influences. That obviously largely occurred among priests and scholars, not the laity. In general, it is difficult to express abstract concepts in Latin, as many scholars admitted. For example, Plato's abstract concept of the truth had to be expressed in Latin as what is always true. Medieval scholars and theologians, translating both the Bible and Greek philosophers into Latin out of the Koine and Classical Greek, cobbled together many new abstract concept words in Latin. Topic. Syntax Indirect discourse, which in Classical Latin was achieved by using a subject accusative and infinitive, was now often simply replaced by new conjunctions serving the function of English. That such as quad, quia, or quonium. There was a high level of overlap between the old and new constructions, even within the same author's work, and it was often a matter of preference. 
A particularly famous and often cited example is from the Venerable Bede, using both constructions within the same sentence. Dico me sire et quad sum ignobilis equals I say that I know accusative and infinitive and that I am unknown new construction. The resulting subordinate clause often used the subjunctive mood instead of the indicative. This new syntax for indirect discourse is among the most prominent features of medieval Latin, the largest syntactical change. Several substitutions were often used instead of subjunctive clause constructions. They did not break the rules of classical Latin but were an alternative way to express the same meaning, avoiding the use of a subjunctive clause. The present participle was frequently used adverbially in place of key or cum clauses, such as clauses of time, cause, concession, and purpose. That was loosely similar to the use of the present participle in an ablative absolute phrase, but the participle did not need to be in the ablative case. Habio I have to and debio I must would be used to express obligation more often than the gerundive. Given that obligation inherently carries a sense of futurity, Carthage must be destroyed. At some point in the future, it anticipates how the Romance languages such as French would use habio as the basis for their future tenses, abandoning the Latin forms of the future tense, while in Latin, amare habio is the indirect discourse, I have to love. In the French equivalent, amari, habio greater than a y y o greater than i, ame plus i, it has become the future tense, I will love, losing the sense of obligation. In medieval Latin, however, it was still in direct discourse and not yet used as simply a future tense. Instead of a clause introduced by ut or ne, an infinitive was often used with a verb of hoping, fearing, promising, etc. Conversely, some authors might haphazardly switch between the subjunctive and indicative forms of verbs, with no intended difference in meaning. The usage of some changed significantly, it was frequently omitted or implied. Further, many medieval authors did not feel that it made sense for the perfect passive construction, laudatus sum, to use the present tense of esse in a past tense construction so they began using fui, the past perfect of some, interchangeably with some. Chaos in the usage of demonstrative pronouns. Hic, il, isti, and even the intensive ipse are often used virtually interchangeably. In anticipation of Romance languages, hic and il were also frequently used simply to express the definite article, the, which classical Latin did not possess. Unis was also used for the indirect article, a, n. Use of reflexives became much looser. A reflexive pronoun in a subordinate clause might refer to the subject of the main clause. The reflexive possessive suus might be used in place of a possessive genitive such as ius. Comparison of adjectives changed somewhat. The comparative form was sometimes used with positive or superlative meaning. Also, the adverb magis was often used with a positive adjective to indicate a comparative meaning, and multum and nimis could be used with a positive form of adjective to give a superlative meaning. Classical Latin used the ablative absolute, but as stated above, in medieval Latin examples of nominative absolute or accusative absolute may be found. This was a point of difference between the ecclesiastical Latin of the clergy and the vulgar Latin of the laity, which existed alongside it. The educated clergy mostly knew that traditional Latin did not use the nominative or accusative case in such constructions, but only the ablative case. These constructions are observed in the medieval era, but they are changes that developed among the uneducated commoners. Classical Latin does not distinguish progressive action in the present tense, thus laudo can mean either I praise or I am praising. In imitation of Greek, medieval Latin could use a present participle with some to form a periphrastic tense equivalent to the English progressive. This Greek periphrastic tense Formation could also be done in the past and future tenses, Loudon's sum, I am praising, Loudon's eram, I was praising, Loudon's arrow, I will be praising. Classical Latin verbs had at most two voices, active and passive, but Greek the original language of the New Testament had an additional, middle voice, or reflexive voice. One use was to express when the subject is acting upon itself, Achilles put the armor onto himself, or Jesus clothed himself in the robe, would use the middle voice. 
Because Latin had no middle voice, medieval Latin expresses such sentences by putting the verb in the passive voice form, but the conceptual meaning is active similar to Latin deponent verbs. For example, the medieval Latin translation of Genesis states literally, "...God was moved over the waters." Spiritus Dei Ferabator Super Aquas, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, but it is just expressing a Greek middle voice verb, God moved himself over the waters. Overlapping with orthography differences, see below, certain diphthongs were sometimes shortened, O to E and A to E. Thus, Ecumenicus becomes the more familiar Ecumenicus. More familiar in this later form because religious terms such as ecumenical were more common in medieval Latin. The o diphthong is not particularly frequent in Latin, but the shift from a to e affects many common words, such as kylum, heaven being shortened to selum, even pueli, girls was shortened to puel. Often, a town would lose its name to that of the tribe which was either accusative or ablative plural, two forms that were then used for all cases, or in other words, considered indeclinable. Orthography Many striking differences between classical and medieval Latin are found in orthography. Perhaps the most striking difference is that medieval manuscripts used a wide range of abbreviations by means of superscripts, special characters etc., for instance the letters N and S were often omitted and replaced by a diacritical mark above the preceding or following letter. Apart from this, some of the most frequently occurring differences are as follows. Clearly many of these would have been influenced by the spelling, and indeed pronunciation, of the vernacular language, and thus varied between different European countries. Following the Carolingian reforms of the 9th century, Carolingian minuscule was widely adopted, leading to a clear differentiation between capital and lowercase letters. A partial or full differentiation between V and U, and between J and I. The diphthong A is usually collapsed and simply written as E or E caudata, E, for example, pueli might be written puel or puel. The same happens with the diphthong O, for example in Peña, Oedipus, from Pina, Oedipus. This feature is already found on coin inscriptions of the 4th century e.g. Republis for Republicae. Conversely, an original E in Classical Latin was often represented by A or O e.g. A Ecclesia and Koina, also reflected in English spellings such as fetus. Because of a severe decline in the knowledge of Greek, in loanwords and foreign names from or transmitted through Greek, Y and I might be used more or less interchangeably, Isidorus, Egyptus, from Isidorus, Egyptus. This is also found in pure Latin words, Osius, more swiftly, appears as Ocyus and Silva as Silva, this last being a form which survived into the 18th century and so became embedded in modern botanical Latin also cf. Pennsylvania, H might be lost, so that Haber becomes a bear, or Mihi becomes me the latter also occurred in Classical Latin, or Mihi may be written Michi, indicating that the H had come to be pronounced as K or perhaps KH. This pronunciation is not found in Classical Latin. The loss of H in pronunciation also led to the addition of H in writing where it did not previously belong, especially in the vicinity of R, such as Chirona for Corona, a tendency also sometimes seen in Classical Latin. T before a vowel is often written as C TSI, so that divitiae becomes divitiae or divitiae, tertius becomes tertius, vidium vicium. The combination Minnesota might have another plosive inserted, so that alumnus becomes alumpness, somnus somnus. Single consonants were often doubled, or vice versa, so that tranquilitas becomes tranquilitas and Africa becomes Africa. Syncopation became more frequent, v, especially in verbs in the perfect tense, might be lost, so that novis becomes nos this occurred in classical Latin as well but was much more frequent in medieval Latin, these orthographical differences were often due to changes in pronunciation or, as in the previous example, morphology, which authors reflected in their writing. By the 16th century, Erasmus complained that speakers from different countries were unable to understand each other's form of Latin. The gradual changes in Latin did not escape the notice of contemporaries. Petrarch, writing in the 14th century, complained about this linguistic decline, which helped fuel his general dissatisfaction with his own era. 
Topic: <inaudible> Medieval Latin literature. The corpus of medieval Latin literature encompasses a wide range of texts, including such diverse works as sermons, hymns, hagiographical texts, travel literature, histories, epics, and lyric poetry. The first half of the 5th century saw the literary activities of the great Christian authors Jerome c. 347 and Augustine of Hippo 354 whose texts had an enormous influence on theological thought of the Middle Ages, and of the latter's disciple Prosper of Aquitaine c. 390 Of the later 5th century and early 6th century, Sidonius Apollinaris c. 430 after 489 and Enodius 474 to 521 both from Gaul are well known for their poems as is Venantius Fortunatus c 530 to 600 this was also a period of transmission the Roman patrician Boethius c 480 to 524 translated part of Aristotle's logical corpus thus preserving it for the Latin West and wrote the influential literary and philosophical treatise De Consolation Philosophiae Cassiodorus c 485 to 585 founded an important library at the monastery of Vivarium near Squillus where many texts from antiquity were to be preserved Isidore of Seville c 560 to 636 collected all scientific knowledge still available in his time into what might be called the first encyclopedia the etymologia Gregory of Tours c 538 to 594 wrote a lengthy history of the Frankish kings Gregory came from a Gallo-Roman aristocratic family and his Latin which shows many aberrations from the classical forms testifies to the declining significance of classical education in Gaul at the same time, good knowledge of Latin and even of Greek was being preserved in monastic culture in Ireland and was brought to England and the European mainland by missionaries in the course of the 6th and 7th centuries, such as Columbanus 543 who founded the monastery of Bobbio in northern Italy. Ireland was also the birthplace of a strange poetic style known as Hesperic Latin. Other important insular authors include the historian Gildas c. 500 to 570 and the poet Aldhelm c. 640 to 709. Benedict Biscop c. 628 to 690 founded the monastery of Wearmouth Jarrow and furnished it with books which he had taken home from a journey to Rome and which were later used by Bede c. 672 to 735 to write his ecclesiastical history of the English people. Many medieval Latin works have been published in the series Patrologia Latina, Corpus Scriptorum Ecclesiasticorum Latinorum and Corpus Christianorum. <inaudible> <inaudible> medieval Latin and everyday life Medieval Latin was separated from Classical Latin around 800 AD and at this time was no longer considered part of the everyday language. Spoken Latin became a practice used mostly by the educated high-class population. Even then it was not frequently used in casual conversation. An example of these men includes the churchman who could read Latin, but could not effectively speak it. Latin's use in universities was structured in lectures and debates, however, it was highly recommended that students use it in conversation. This practice was only kept up due to rules. One of Latin's purposes, writing, was still in practice, the main uses being charters for property transactions and to keep track of the pleadings given in court. Even then, those of the church still used Latin more than the rest of the population. At this time, Latin served little purpose to the regular population but was still used regularly in ecclesiastical culture. Topic: Important medieval Latin authors. 4th–5th centuries Etheria, Florida, 385 Jerome, c. 347–420 Augustine, 354–430 6th–8th centuries Boethius, c. 480–525 Cassiodorus, c. 485, c. 585. Gildas, d. c. 570. Flavius Cresconius Corippus, d. c. 570. Venantius Fortunatus, c. 
530 c. 600 Gregory of Tours c. 538 to 594 Pope Gregory the 1st c. 540 to 604 Isidore of Seville c. 560 to 636 Bede c. 672 to 735 Saint Boniface c. 672 to 754 Cradagong of Metz d. 766 Paul the Deacon 720s c.799 Beatus of Liabana c 730 to 800 Peter of Pisa d 799 Paulinus of Aquileia 730s 802 Alcuin c 735 to 804 Topic 9th century Einhard 775 to 840 Rabanus Morris 782 856 Pascagius Radbertus 792 865 Rudolf of Fulda D 865 Duada Lupus of Ferriers 805 to 862 Andreas Agnellus Agnellus of Ravenna C 805 to 846 Hinkmar 806 to 882 Wallafred Strabo 808 to 849 Florus of Lyon D 860 Gotchik theologian 808 to 867 Sedulius Scotus Florida 840 to 860 Anastasius Bibliothecarius 810 to 878 Johannes Scotus Eriugena 815 to 877 Asser D 909 Notker Balbulus 840 to 912 Topic 10th century Rathirius 890 to 974 Rotsvitha of Gandersheim 935 to 973 Dietmar of Merseburg 9751018 Topic 11th century Marianus Scotus 1028 to 1082 Adam of Bremen Florida 1060 to 1080 Marbodius of Rennes C 1035 to 1123 Topic: 12th century. Pierre Abelard, 1079 to 1142. Sugar of Saint Denis, c. 1081 to 1151. Geoffrey of Monmouth, c. 1100 c. 1155. Aelred of Rivo, 1110 to 1167. Otto of Frazing, c. 1114 to 1158. Archpoet C. 1130 C. 1165. William of Tyre C. 1130 to 1185. Peter of Blois C. 1135 C. 1203. Walter of Chatelone Florida C. 1200. Adam of Saint Victor. Topic. 13th century. Geraldus Cambrensis, c. 1146 c. 1223. Saxo Grammaticus, c. 1150 c. 1220. Anonymous, Florida, late 12th century, early 13th century. Thomas of Chilano, c. 1200 c. 1265. Albertus Magnus, c. 1200 to 1280. Roger Bacon, c. 1214 to 1294. Saint Thomas Aquinas, c. 1225 to 1274. Ramon Lule, 1232 to 1315. Seeger of Brabant, c. 1240 to 1280s. Duns Scotus, c. 1266 to 1308. Topic. 14th century. Randolph Higdon, c. 1280 c. 1363 William of Ockham c 1288 c 1347 
Jean Buridan, 1300 to 1358. Henry Suso, c. 1295 to 1366. Literary movements. Goliards, Hiberno Latin, Medieval Roman law, Medieval Latin comedy. Topic. Works Carmina Burana, 11th 12th century, Pang Lingua, CA.1250, Summa Theologia, CA.1270, Etymologia, CA.600, Dies Array, CA.1260, Decretum Gratiani, CA.1150 De ortu waluuni e nepotis artori, CA.1180 Magna Carta, CA.1215 References Citations Sources Further reading Siobhan Mazel, Claudine A., and Margaret M. Smith, eds. 1996. Medieval Manuscripts of the Latin Classics, Production and Use, Proceedings of the Seminar in the History of the Book to 1500, Leiden, 1993. Los Altos Hills, C.A., Anderson Lovelace. Lapage, Michael, 1993. Anglo-Latin Literature 900-1066. London and Rio Grande, O., Hambledon. 1996. Anglo-Latin Literature 600–899. London and Rio Grande, O., Hambledon. Mann, Nicholas, and Berger Monk Olson, eds. 1997. Medieval and Renaissance Scholarship, Proceedings of the Second European Science Foundation Workshop on the Classical Tradition in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, London, Warburg Institute, 27–28 of November 1992. New York, Brill. Mantello, F.A.C., and George Rigg, 1996. Medieval Latin, An Introduction and Bibliographical Guide. Washington, D.C., Catholic University of American Press. Pecheri, Aronzo, and Michael D. Reeve, 1995. Formative Stages of Classical Traditions, Latin Texts from Antiquity to the Renaissance, Proceedings of a Conference held at Aris, 16–22 October 1993, as the sixth course of International School for the Study of Written Records. Spoleto, Italy, Centro Italiano di Studi Sull'Alto Medioevo. Rabi, F.J.E. 1957. A History of Secular Latin Poetry in the Middle Ages, 2 vols. 2nd ed. Oxford, Clarendon. Rig, A.G. 1992. A History of Anglo-Latin Literature A.D. 1066-1422. Cambridge, UK, Cambridge University Press. Wald, Christine, ed. 2012. Brill's New Poly Supplement 5, The Reception of Classical Literature. Leiden, The Netherlands, and Boston, Brill. Ziolkowski, Jan M., 1993. Talking Animals, Medieval Latin Beast Poetry, 750-1150. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania Press. Raby, F.J.E., 1959. The Oxford Book of Medieval Latin Verse. Amen House, London, Oxford University Press. Harrington, Carl Pomeroy, 1942. Medieval Latin. Norwood, M.A., USA, Norwood Press. Dronk, Peter, Vol. 1, 1965. Medieval Latin and the Rise of European Love Lyric. Oxford, UK, Clarendon Press. Bocci, Antoni. Varia Latinitatis Scripta II, Inscriptions Orationes Epistvli. Rome, Italy, Societas Librania Stvdivm. Bizon, Charles H., 1925. A Primer of Medieval Latin, an Anthology of Prose and Poetry. Chicago, United States, Scott, Forsman and Company. Curtius, Ernst Roberts, 1953. European Literature and the Latin Middle Ages. New York, New York, United States, Bollingen Foundation Inc. Auerbach, Eric, 1965. Literary Language and its Public, in Late Latin Antiquity and in the Middle Ages. New York, New York, USA, Bollingen Foundation. 
Topic external links In-depth guides to learning Latin at the UK National Archives. The Journal of Medieval Latin Rite, Thomas, ed. A Selection of Latin Stories, from Manuscripts of the 13th and Fountainth Centuries, A Contribution to the History of Fiction During the Middle Ages, London, The Percy Society, 1842, Corpus Corporum mlat.uzh.ch Corpus Thomisticum Corpus Thomisticum.org Lacuscursius Penelope, UChicago. Adieu.